show. Thank you. I am your host, Monica Jai. It is a privilege and honor to have you here. A Gambian, a politician, the speaker of the coalition, which you did a fantastic job. You were born and raised in Sarikuna, um, the Secretary General of the PDOIs, um, representing um, PDOIs again um, in this National Assembly. Um, congratulations, Mr. Salah. Thank you very much. I am honored to have you. Thank you. Um, what do you want to achieve for this matter, being a National Assembly member again, representing Sarikuna? The situation is different this time because we built a coalition that earned victory in the 4th December 2016 presidential elections. The first phase of transition is to change the executive and that has happened. What people do not fully understand is the role of the National Assembly. Uh, in the, the Second Republic, in the National Assembly, as people used to say, became what they call rubber stamp. In essence, the executive had full control of the National Assembly members because the ruling party had the majority uh, of the uh, seats. Consequently, uh, the president could remove National Assembly members as he wished based on the distortion of the objective of Section 91 1D of the Constitution. Uh, that provision was included in the uh, Second Republican Constitution because of abuse in the First Republic where if you stand as NCP, uh, you could be offered ministerial posts because at that time there was no separation of uh, the legislature and the executive. So consequently, you could harness it through the opposition and then what they call cross carpeted cross <laughs> yes. that's, that's how the term yeah, yeah. You know, emerged. Mm -hmm. So in addressing that issue, mm -hmm. the constitution provided for uh, 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 a remedy mm -hmm. by affirming that if you cease to be a member of the party uh, to which you were a member when you were elected, right. uh, then you lose your seat and go for by election. Okay. But because of the absolutism of executive power mm -hmm. of, of, of Jami, uh, he earned the power to dismiss members of his party and that was utilized uh, against the National Assembly members. So any time he wished, he could drive you away from the party and automatically you lose your seat in the National Assembly. So in short, uh, we had a National Assembly which could not uh, exercise the right of uh, uh, oversight. And that is the role of the National Assembly. The National Assembly is designed uh, to enable executive power uh, to abide by the rule of law um, by being the uh, institution to which ministers and the executive uh, are accountable to for the performance of their responsibilities. And that accountability come in the forms of uh, being asked questions by National Assembly members for ministers to answer. Uh, it comes in the form that when budgets are presented, uh, ministers are required to also elaborate on government policy uh, for the next following year. So in that sense, the National Assembly members would have the power to be able to analyze what is presented and give alternative policy options if they have the capacity to do so. Uh, it is also important to bear in mind that under the manifesto of the coalition, principle in its objectives is constitutional reform and legal reform, especially reform of the Elections Act, uh, reform of the Constitution. So in that sense, uh, you would need to have a National Assembly uh, embodied with people of competence who will be able to promote 
that drive for constitutional reform. We talked about the absence of a term limit. So in the coming uh, National Assembly, uh, we must pioneer the establishment of a term limit. Uh, we have looked at uh, the Constitution and look at the Elections uh, Act. And obviously, the uh, people in the diaspora even have the right to vote. But that is not being exercised at the moment. So it means that uh, the National Assembly must uh, be ready to facilitate all that uh, in collaboration with the executive. Uh, you also know that uh, the president, uh, under the first, uh, Second Republic, could uh, even go and start removing uh, members of the Independent Electoral Commission, appoints the members of the Independent Electoral Commission. Uh, obviously, there should be constitutional reforms uh, to enhance the independence of the Electoral Commission and also guarantee security of tenure. The executive on the Second Republic uh, even tampered with the judiciary by removing judges. So essentially, all these provisions need to be looked at again and uh, redrafted to ensure that there are no loopholes. So you're talking about a whole uh, uh, constitutional reform agenda, agenda true. Uh, which has to be pioneered and uh, ensured by National Assembly members with competence. And I believe that uh, the demand for a new uh, order uh, requires that we build new institutions, and we cannot build new institutions without having people of competence uh, to preside over them. And uh, clearly, my role this time, as I have said, is to help build the National Assembly uh, that uh, suits uh, 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 liberated Gambia because Gambia has been liberated uh, and what is essential now is to build its instruments and its institutions and the practices to ensure that that liberation is not lost uh, down the line because if we just accept that electoral liberation uh, immediately translates into real liberation of the people will be mistaken electoral liberation is the starting process because it asserts that the sovereignty of the people will determine the manner of government of the country and that the sovereignty of the people is real because people have the power to put governments into office and to remove them. And that is now clear to every Gambian. No Gambian can now say, no, we cannot remove a president. It's so powerful. Uh, the abuses are so immense. Uh, clearly, let's forget about it. Nothing can happen now. We are sure. That so you think just um, for you being a national assembly member by yourself, you know, I, I know you will have uh, other um, PDOIs candidates in the national assembly, but just by yourself having that taught, that idea, that's, that's what you want to implement, imp implement in the constitution and the laws. Would you make a difference, just one person? Well, what you must bear in mind is that we formed a coalition with a manifesto. What I'm saying is in the coalition manifesto. So this, all, all these eight uh, uh, groups in the coalition are duty-bound to, to work for the implementation. So here we are just uh, giving guarantees the commitment of DOI to constitutional reform is so evident that obviously our presence will uh, enable us to exercise leadership in that drive, which means that uh, nobody can throw eyes on the other direction and forget about constitutional reform. We will be uh, pointing that out and showing what we have agreed in the manifesto and make it a priority so that at least that, that is effective. Yeah. So how many candidates did um, PDOIs put forward? I mean, well, women, women um, candidates are not talking about because if you're talking about the Every Woman Show, it's about empowering women, you know, the grassroots women especially. Um, we want to see more women in politics. Much more. Well, uh, I must tell you that the policy of DOI is in fact to have the one-third quota system that we advocate for proportional representation so that ultimately you must guarantee one-third of membership of all institutions, executive in terms of ministerial posts, the National Assembly and the councils, you know, 
for that agenda drive. That is a policy, but that cannot be the policy of the coalition government because it's a transitional instrument. So essentially what we have done, uh, there is no proportional representation under the constitution. So it's forced past the post and women must offer themselves you know, to stand. What had happened is four women had offered themselves, others had interests, we encouraged them, uh, but unfortunately when it uh, came to the final phase, uh, uh, only four managed to survive. You know, so, yeah, so, 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 yeah, it's fantastic. So, so, the number now. Yes. We are hoping maybe the next four years, the yes, next five years, yes. we'll have double that or triple that number. Yes, yes, yes. So, we're talking about youths, youths, youths. You mm. know, they're important, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. So, what do you think? Yeah. Um, what is the new government um, aims? Well, well, in the manifesto, as I said, at this moment, I am moving towards being a national assembly member. The government has ministers, a minister of youth. I'm sure he's more competent to talk about government policy on youth. But um, essentially, as an aspiring national assembly member, my duty will be to look at all government policies and emphasize uh, the key uh, issues that should be handled with regards to all segments of society and definitely uh, the youth population uh, requires much attention. Uh, they constitute the cornerstone of the future. If you fail to prepare them, you are failed in preparing for the future. So in that respect, uh, what is important to look at the education system uh, the curriculum to see how civic awareness, citizenship education uh, would be enhanced uh, to prepare young people to have a clear focus of their role in the general division of labor in society and work assiduously. This is very important. So uh, um, from our representation in National Assembly, I am sure you will ultimately see that the bulk of our National Assembly aspirants are young people. So it means that we have started the balance uh, right from the get-go within the party structure itself. It is also important to bear in mind that government policy, economic policy, uh, although this is a transitional government, one should not expect that it will solve all problems of unemployment. What we anticipate is that we will be making recommendations from the angle of the National Assembly uh, for the government to at least select the type of economic policies that can enhance youth employment. It is very evident that as you build infrastructural development, uh, the employment will be generated at that level. As you process what you are producing uh, into value-added goods, well, obviously, you'll be able to also enhance uh, some employment. As you develop some selective schemes of giving support to small enterprises, uh, cooperative schemes to enhance the earning capacity of those who are involved in those enterprises, obviously you'll be able to generate uh, self-employment. So we will be contributing our quota, looking realistically at the potential of the economy and in our analysis of budgets during budget sessions and presentations by ministers of their policies, we'll definitely be encouraging that, that every minister uh, will also come to the National Assembly to indicate the strategic plan of, of their institutions so that at least uh, policy making will be linked to the concerns of the people because the National Assembly members uh, would constitute the eyes, ears, and mouths of the population. They, like me in Serakunda, should be able to know exactly what is happening and what the needs are, what uh, the different categories of society uh, is demanding. So in that, uh, it is important uh, that for us, we should be able to uh, elaborate on this at the level of the National Assembly and government should be able to pick you know, what it needs to be able to at least have a very smooth transition. Talking about that, um, coming 
to your house here today. Um, this is the real Gambia you leave. You, leave. you step out every day, you see things, you come out, uh, you come back home, it's, it's still the same thing. It's not like you're living somewhere that, you know, all the infrastructure to build and the roads is unbelievably um, nice. It is nice here, but um, you see real life as well. This is what I'm talking about. Well, outside. Well, every morning you hear the vehicles come, five o'clock in the morning. And uh, you can hear uh, the, uh, the environment mm. telling you these people are. Uh, and when they start coming into the compound to draw water, to answer to the call of nature, then you begin to see real Gambia. Uh, women hard working they are coming from Burfoot, from Sanyang, from the whole over the combos and this is where they come to sell their vegetables and sometimes you will see that uh, they cannot else even sell it and it perishes uh, so you cannot talk about a lack of initiative there is hard work and these are very hard working women uh, uh, you coming five o'clock in the morning, you stay here until midday to be able to sell these vegetables and you can see uh, what they actually earn, these pittance. And you can see what they wear, is real extreme poverty. So you see extreme poverty and uh, you see the responsibility that we have to address it. And, uh, and there is absolutely no doubt, it's a reminder and that poverty is a reality and that women wear the face of poverty. And I believe that uh, that realization, of course, inspires me every day to see that uh, uh, electoral changes uh, do not necessarily uh, automatically lead to changes in the lives of the people. I knew what it was. Uh, before the elections, and I see what it is after the elections. So clearly, the challenge before us is precisely that. How do you improve the living standards of such people? You can see some of them with their baby suckling mothers. In, uh, after, uh, after being on the hot sun, they must struggle to at least get shade in, uh, for some time, suckle, and then go back. It's, it's real hardship. It's hardship. I'm, I'm, I'm shocked, you know, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm really shocked. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't leave it, mm -hmm. you will not. You will not. Know it, yeah. So you know it. Mm -hmm. You are the spokesperson mm -hmm. for them. Mm -hmm. You are their mouthpiece. Mm -hmm. You need to represent them. You mm -hmm. need to um, make sure that things are different for them as well. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. and, and I believe mm -hmm. um, Sarah Kanada would know your intentions and, and do the right thing this time. Well, what I, what I keep on telling the women, because some complain, because you want to come out and you see that the gates are open, you want to park, you see that uh, they are there, this is their market. Uh, sometimes uh, police uh, authorities from the councils uh, have problems with them here and there, moving there. So I constantly emphasize that this is the challenge. And you should ask me or any politician, uh, how do you address this challenge? Is not wishing it away that they should not be here. Uh, how do you prevent them from being here? And I emphasize to them that, you see, this is why the economic policy is the answer. That without fertilizer, without seeds, without implements, you cannot help farmers to overcome poverty. You cannot help these gardeners to overcome poverty. And without markets, it's the same thing. The same. They can produce without being to sell. So uh, in essence, you must link these two. And obviously, uh, what is needed is systematic approach of production link to processing. And that will lead to the purchase of their vegetables right there at their gardens and taking them where they'll be processed or purchase of the vegetables right there at their gardens and have a more organized vegetable markets to be able to sell them. 
So uh, this is what is required. And when that is available, you will not see the women in the street. So the, the essence here is uh, we are faced with policy challenges, and I emphasize to them that this is a transitional government. You should not expect that all these policies will be made under the circumstances, because the fundamental objective was to uproot and entrench a self-perpetuating uh, ruler, and therefore uh, that task has been achieved. Uh, what is expected is the government to do its best, mm -hmm. but what is expected is that the architect to establish under a transitional administration will ultimately be expanded and sustained by the next following government, which will have a term and even maybe a second term if the term limit is established to be able to look at the real problems of the women and provide real solutions to earn any respectability. Okay. Um, taking you back, we're still with women. Um, we have worked as a social worker in the social department, if I'm right. Social That's welfare office, yes. Social welfare office. Yeah. Um, if you were to change three things there, what would it be and why? Well, one, you, you must... You still know the system. Yeah, the yes, you know, the, the situation of uh, a social welfare department mm -hmm. under the current it's, order... It's, it still affects it, them, isn't it? Yes, is yes. that you do not have a real welfare system. Mm -hmm. uh, a real welfare system will be able to accumulate resources mm -hmm and then provide for those who have been left uh, behind in the development process and ensure that they survive. Mm -hmm. But here uh, you have people who are so extremely poor uh, that uh, the social welfare department just simply give small uh, pittance mm -hmm. that cannot really remove them from poverty. Mm -hmm. uh, the second dimension, it deals uh, with issues created by poverty itself, broken marriages, which increases in, in numbers. So child support, increases in numbers. But child support for a, a man who is earning less than $2,000, uh, less than $3,000, clearly a cost of living, it means that you are just taking both of them Mm, and, and to the extreme level of poverty. So, in essence, the poverty of the country uh, is revealed with more uh, thoroughness when you work there because you see the poverty in the countryside, you see the people with challenges of, uh, of, 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 of uh, uh, physical challenges, the physically challenged, you see the problems of the poor. Uh, so, clearly, it pricks your conscience to know that under the current order, such problems cannot be solved. So you must talk about change of society. I think this is what propelled me more towards uh, the political agenda, yeah. that change was necessary mm -hmm. to be able to address the poverty that I saw, mm -hmm. because the poverty was so immense and one could not close one's eyes to it. So something had to be done. I'm going to take you back to Yes. Mm. That was just, um, I wouldn't say put under the carpet because I'm sure you have been dealing with it. And there are many other people that were trying their best as well to bring it up to the public's knowledge. There were so many students affected. Um, the survivors, uh, most of them are the, what, what can you tell us about um, April 10 and 11? Take me back to April 10 and 11. I've read an article um, two days ago that um, someone said, you know, I was there, Mr. Halifa Salah was the only one that came up to our rescue. So I'm going to take you back to April 10 and 11. It was not a political demonstration mm -hmm. at all. And no conspiracy theory mm -hmm. will be valid in this instance. Uh, what had happened is a young man mm, taken by the fire officers, mm, giving the impression that he was being given good training, ultimately so extremely maltreated 
that he died. So the students became concerned and started to raise issues. Then, during the period, another girl was uh, allegedly raped, so that inflamed the situation. And the students felt that the authorities were not doing much. So they began a more active uh, uh, approach to the issue to get them to be concerned. Uh, eventually, uh, it uh, uh, got to a stage where they felt that the authorities were completely negligent and would not listen to what they had to say. So they began to move towards uh, protests of what happened. And that was also gradual. Uh, I remember the student leader came to me. I had to write a letter to the Minister of Interior then. Uh, and uh, I emphasized, and the Minister of Education, emphasizing the need for action to be taken. I received a reply from the Minister of Education that, yes, what is said is, is very uh, accurate and efforts will be done to do so. But then the Minister of Interior granting the students uh, the right to demonstrate uh, he, he was not forthcoming and they became more impatient and I believe that the student leader who was trying to uh, make them to bow down to uh, a reasonable mm -hmm. uh, uh, conclusion as he felt mm -hmm. uh, eventually was seen as a coward and then there was a lot of anger being uh, directed at him. I remember he came to me really sad telling me that uh, well the students are pushing for demonstration these people have not given any permit for demonstration and I remember my experience as a student leader of Gamsu. We went to the state house when these people newly took over the government, and we were driven away. And guns were being cocked, you know, so that we can rush out of that state house. He said, "I know that there are some trigger happy people there, and if these students go in the street, I fear that violence will occur. But I can no longer control them." So uh, I remember writing to, to show emphasis that something should be done about it. It was not done. The students moved into action. And that morning, uh, um, the protest started. Uh, I remember calling a military authority and said that, well, uh, this has started and this should be handled uh, in a very careful way. Failing to handle in a careful way will lead to a situation that everybody will live to regret. Uh, as I was speaking to him, uh, he said, yes, well, we'll send our forces, we'll try to do so, and promise was given. As soon as I put my phone down, the phone rang again and said there was shooting at GTTI. That was the first shooting. So I called him again, this authority, and said that shooting has taken place. He said, no, that has not taken place. We have not given any authority of shooting. I said, shooting has taken place. This is what I'm informed. He said, well, I'll go and check. That was the end, because I am sure he discovered that this is what has taken place. They also went into the street and started moving about to find out what was going on. Well, we decided to talk to the young people, because they were so inflamed by what has happened. And some would have burned the petrol stations. You know, the, the, all trends were there. Uh, towards real conflagration of the conflict. So we had to move about, talk to them, and said, yes, protest, yes. But burning of petrol stations, you know, how many people will die? How many people will suffer? So some element of rationality was put uh, to a point that they became tempered uh, in, in, in action. And I remember, in fact, the CDS, who went about, chief of defense staff, because the students had been uh, calm after a while, uh, went move with them, uh, almost like a hostage, but not really a hostage, but he was the only one. It's like if they wanted to harm him, they will harm him. This was the chief of defense staff. But they marched with him, and uh, the people we posted to follow the whole trend, went with them all the way to the PIU you know, camp, which is at Carnifang. 
and opposite the camp, uh, more shooting took place. And this is where many students actually died, who were defenseless, uh, who were not showing any violent attack against the chief of defense staff whom they had arrested. So that was clear indication that they were not in a mood to kill, destroy anybody. But then they were killed mercilessly. So that became a real issue. Uh, the government tried to cover up what we unearth everything. It could not cover up anymore. Uh, it did not want to carry out a commission of inquiry, but uh, they were pushed to carry out a commission of inquiry. The civil society became very active, uh, very adamant, uh, very much aggrieved. And there is no doubt that at that moment, Gambia had changed because people knew that unless they took a stand, well, uh, lives will continue to be lost like this. We played a part, everybody played a part, civil society played a part in emphasizing to the government that this is one issue that uh, cover-up is unacceptable. So um, we recommended a coroner's inquest, that this is the way uh, to handle the matter. A coroner's inquest was held and obviously uh, if you read the documents, nothing was covered, no covered up, everything was properly investigated, families were very much, dis uh, very much satisfied and conclusions were reached of death, of murder, uh, and of massacre. It's evident in the coroner's inquest in, in, in very clear terms and consequently the government looked at it and at first wanted to uh, reject. Uh, the report, everybody insisted, uh, day and night they were being told this is the artifacts, you know, do something about it and they had to set up a commission of inquiry. Uh, many letters were written from us so we had to get uh, the young people that we asked to follow, uh, the young people who were moving with the CDS to give uh, testimony so that our accounts will be given and I must say that the CDS had to confirm that everything we had written you know in our analysis uh, were accurate and consequently uh, all the writings were accepted as part of the evidence and uh, they came to conclusion pointed the accusing fingers and made a recommendation so in short uh, Gambia was heading for change as far as we are concerned in 2001. But some unfortunate incident really uh, changed the mood, the whole atmosphere. And that was the death of Alim Jai in, yes, in URR, and then lawyer that was arrested, charged with murder, and then the state started to focus more on that, and society also began to, to look more on, on those, those issues than the, what happened on April 10th. Yes, 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 yes. Everything, everything, everything is changed in terms of direction. Uh, then the families also were being assisted so that they know how to fight their rights by bringing them together and articulating what their challenges were. But eventually they stayed, visited families and uh, of course you will not know how much was given but you know, here tokenism just took the place of justice and uh, eventually we were appearing more like busy bodies if yes. you want to yes. get them so we started to leave them on their own. But one young man who should be given a hero's medal, uh, Abdul Karim Jamme. Uh, he was a survivor. Uh, of course, his life dented because he was in school. These were mostly grade 9, grade 10. Uh, he could not complete his education. We had to, uh, and others had to assist him in one way or the other to have further training. But uh, you could see this intelligent young man uh, suffering from educational abortion. Uh, that he could not actually continue to be the person he wanted to be. And up till now, of course, he had gone to Germany for some surgery 
and there should have been continuation of the surgery, but there was discontinuation. So, in short, uh, uh, financial, yes, you know, so uh, there is nothing established for him, uh, for what had happened to him. So, what would this present government do um, about what happened? Well, these are issues that we have said that uh, yes. the... Yes, 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 and obviously the Attorney General's Chambers is the right channel to write letters and uh, talk about issues and consequently uh, this is where policies could arise in terms of addressing you know, such issues. So it's left to those who have been the victims to continue to articulate what has happened to them and uh, we will guide them to take the right channel. So they have to make the first move, then yes. the government would... Well, yeah, yeah one, one, must, one must be guided to use the right channels, okay. you know, to handle such situation. Okay. As I, I said, uh, the issue is no longer... Uh, you, you don't become busybody in mm -hmm. issues of this nature, mm -hmm. because we are talking about issues of fact mm -hmm. that has to be established and then pursued by those who know what it felt and are more determined to ensure that justice is done. Justice is done, yeah. Um, yeah, thank you. Into towards the last one, you have to answer with a yes or a no. Mm. Everyone is, everybody is dying to know. Were you offered a position, a ministerial position? I want to know, and so many others want to know as well. Were you offered? So you, this, the situation is that um, the coalition government established uh, what we now know mm -hmm. as the executive. Mm -hmm. And the executive has absolute power to give ministerial posts. Mm -hmm. uh, I have no doubt that I can assume a ministerial post. Absolutely. But uh, the issue uh, did not even uh, become an issue as far as we... No, it's not an issue. Uh, yeah, because as, as, as between me and President Bang, because uh, our conception is that this is a transitional administration. Uh, we have told the Gambian people that look at services uh, and look at uh, agriculture, look at industry, that if you look at the service sector, it is contributing 67% of GDP. You know, agriculture is contributing 20% and industry 13%. But if you look at the performance, uh, agriculture in 2014 declined by, you know, 7.2 percent. Uh, and you look at uh, services, the key, declined by 8.2 percent. And then marginal development in industrial growth of 2.7 percent. But if you look at the country, you do not see any processing really taking place of value-added goods to provide employment. Uh, we have always said that in order to transform the economy, you would need an agricultural base where you provide fertilizer, farming implements, uh, seeds to farmers so that they can expand their family farms, the gardens, to process the tomato extract into value-added goods to be able to generate employment. We've emphasized that we must be able to unearth all our uh, natural resources, mineral resources, and um, whatever we have in terms of petroleum, to be able to generate uh, what we call uh, the, 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 uh, the expanded form of, of economic base that uh, once we come to a point where we build real sovereign national wealth, we'll be able to deal with our electricity problem, we'll be able to deal with water problem, infrastructural problem, uh, but this is a long-term project. We believe that this is a transitional administration. It is capable of doing something, but the ultimate objective was to remove an entrenched self-perpetuating ruler. That was the objective, and we have achieved that. So we are saying, if you see Halifa Salah in the administration, 
many will believe that what we have been saying as though is what is going to happen. And when it does not happen, they'll begin to wonder, ah, you know, what have these been people saying and look at them. So we believe we can serve the administration better by ensuring that the expectations of the people will be properly uh, put across uh, in the right way, you know, so that they will not believe that the administration is out to do what it is not in a position to do. So that is why, to us, we believe our agenda could only be fulfilled in the National Assembly, where we will be able to continue to analyze and help the government to realistically assess what it's capable of doing and do that. And in terms of the laws, also help them to build up the, the, the architecture for constitutional reform, legal reform, civil service reform, uh, civil reform, and all other reforms that are necessary, at least for this government to fulfill its mandate, which is a transitional mandate. So that is the contradiction that many people uh, did not really uh, put into consideration, which we have addressed with the president. Uh, he's been appointing me as special advisor, etc., giving me different responsibilities, and we have continued to emphasize this. We brought about the coalition. We invited all these uh, presidents, uh, presidential candidates of the opposition to a meeting at Kairababich. We gave legitimacy to the opposition who could not even hold meeting in any respectable place. We held it at Kairababich to give prominence to the opposition and start a process which would not be seen as subversion somewhere else. And that legitimacy eventually gave rise to a convention which we supported. And I dare say that when the campaign came, we mobilized more resources than anybody internally uh, to be able to support the campaign. And when there was an impasse, we did, you know, in, 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 with all humility, uh, what most people did not even expect to ensure that we have the peace that we have. And when President Barrow was in, 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 in Dakar, uh, you know, I played a major role in, in stabilizing the country until it comes and hand it over to him. So in short, there is really no contradiction uh, as far as we're concerned. There are some people trying to play politics with this because I think they have political ambition of the future. If they, and I don't think they will, they would want Hali Vasala to appear as this personality throughout this transition and then move into another election with that part of reputation. So we understand that they are fighting a future battle today uh, by yeah, trying to create some uh, thinking in the minds of people that there is a contradiction, we are out of the coalition, etc. I believe that uh, it does not matter much. We are there with him, giving him support, and he knows uh, what we think about the transition, and he knows what we are contributing to that transition and I must say I may be more, much more closer to him mm -hmm. than many people who pretend to be his defenders that I can vouch for right. because uh, for the two of us it's an everyday contract to perform one task or the other Although, and, and, and I'm satisfied with that and he's satisfied with that. You are very, very mm. diplomatic mm. because I'm sure the answer I was looking for would be yes or no. <laughs> but you have framed it in a much better way. I hope everyone else that was concerned and uh, a little bit angry that you not have a ministerial post, they wanted to no, There's no need for anger, really. Yeah. I think uh, we have a very, very, very sophisticated relationship. He even offered me his uh, office of being a special advisor, which has a ministerial salary, um, bodyguards and transports, you know, so you would exist as a minister, I told him, huh? If a person is an advisor and you provide that advisor with all those paraphernalia, uh, then obviously uh, I wonder whether that advisor will be telling you the truth. So for me, leave all that behind. I am a voluntary special advisor and uh, I'm comfortable and with that. Very much comfortable with that because I chose to be a voluntary special advisor. So we'll, we'll leave it as that. Thank okay. you very much. Thank, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. I am very pleased that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>